So um, this talk is on production debugging. Um, so specifically debugging techniques that are used in production environments. I'm sure everybody's debugged stuff. Everyone here knows how to program, right? Nobody. Okay, well, it's going to be very boring. Um, so I'm Theo uh, on, on Twitter. I'm Postwait. Um, I write a lot of code. Uh, so I'm very, very active in open source, uh, not exclusively, in fact, not even that much in the ASF, um, though I am on the Apache, Apache traffic server, um, uh, PMC. Uh, but I, I've contributed to what I would consider countless open source projects at this point um, and done a significant amount of kernel work. Um, so prerequisites for this um, is that everybody understands Unix. Everybody has, understands what a shell is and they're comfortable at that. Um, they understand what a concept of a syscall is, um, which I'll describe very briefly a little bit later, um, and that you can read C code um, because Unix or die, right? Okay. So, the other really nice to have, um, really nice to have Richie back, but we're not going to. Not everybody can be a Turing Award winner either. Um, but to understand exactly how kernels work. Um, so just understanding what a syscall is and how you've transitioned from user space into your kernel uh, usually is not enough to intuit the right questions to ask in production malfunctions. Uh, you actually need to know kind of what the kernel is doing and, and what the kernel developers were thinking about. And if you don't know that, the, quick, the ability to quickly navigate into the source tree and kind of find out what they were doing, what data structures they were using, what code paths are used. Um, for example, if somebody's gonna open a TCP connection to you and you're, and you're calling accept and for some reason it doesn't go into your app. Like, well, you called accept in your app and it never woke up, so what, what the, where the hell did it go? You kind of need to know how do the list and queues work in the kernel? What, what part of the code base does that, does that you know, touch? Um, also really helps really helps to be able to read assembly code and reconcile that with what, what you think the app is supposed to be doing. Not, not particularly to be able to fix compiler bugs, um, but there are certain debugging techniques that, that work better on an assembly level. So, uh, framing what we're gonna talk about. Um, the point here is that something's broken in production. Either there's a performance degradation that's, that's significant, um, or you have a functionality problem. Um, and what I'm gonna talk about today is mostly functionality issues, uh, mainly because everything I'm gonna talk about applies to performance, but it's probably not where you would start. There are other techniques that are a little bit more holistic um, that will probably get you better, better gains more quickly um, if you're focusing solely on performance. Uh, in particular, um, there's a, a methodology for doing performance diagnosis uh, that was proposed by Brendan Gregg uh, who I think won the Usenix Systems Administrator of the Year Award last year, um, that is uh, utilization, saturation, and errors, this method of progressing through those. And that's much better for performance. Um, it'll get you to your end faster. Um, once you've diagnosed your performance problem and you're trying to actually fix it, these techniques can come back into play a lot better. Um, specifically, uh, I'm sure everybody has used a debugger. Everyone? Yes, good. You've stopped your program and inspected variables. Yes, okay. So what we're really gonna be talking about here is where you can't stop your program. Um, because when you stop it, service stops. Um, and a lot of times in, in high uh, transaction volume production environments, when the service stops, you have some other system that says, oh crap, I'm gonna reboot that box or I'm going to restart that, uh, I'm gonna crash that process. Uh, intentionally, just to make sure that it continues operating. So there's a lot of, uh, if, you're, if you're working on a message queue, for example, it's passing a million messages a second, you, you, you can't just attach GDB and be like, well, put a breakpoint in and stop it and look around at all your variables. I mean, every second, a million messages get dropped or get backlogged. So that sort of stuff doesn't work. Um, the other situation here is that um, you can't reasonably repeat the problem in development and you're pretty confident that by restarting the service, it's gonna fix the problem, um, which is kind of the worst case scenario in production. Um, we have those issues, um, unfortunately, often, where you have a, a piece of software, it's not behaving as you would expect it to behave, um, and you're fairly certain that, you, what's the most common debugging, anybody know what the, the most common debugging technique ever, anywhere is? That, that's resolution technique, debugging technique, like printf, exactly, right? So 
inevitably you're going to look at your program and you're going to be like, I wonder if it's doing that. And then you go put a printf in, but of course if you print, put a printf in, you either need to rejet or recompile or reload, which makes your problem go away. <laughs> right? So now you've put the printf in, but you have changed the situation, so now you have to wait another three weeks for the problem to manifest. And those sorts of problems are evil, evil problems. Um, so that's what we're going to talk about. You'll notice my non-Linux shirt on, and I will uh, encourage everyone to have an open mind. Um, I'm going to be talking about Dtrace just a little bit, and Dtrace exists on Linux if you want to worship a second god, Larry Ellison. Um, I don't suggest doing that. A lot of the techniques here can be translated to system tap, but you're kind of on your own there. Um, so, um, so why not performance? Um, Again, specifically, there are diagnosis techniques for performance that diverge significantly from what we're going to talk about. So the first thing in production is that you have to have a cool mindset. Like, If the system isn't a serious production system, you probably don't even need these techniques anyway. right? You can take your time and try to recreate the problem, reproduce it in a test lab. That's always the best idea anyway. right? So now you have a complete constraint. A set of constraints around the problem. You can produce a test uh, suite test um, or a regression test that, that kind of repeats your problem in isolation, which gives you a much higher confidence that you fixed your problem when you're done. All of that's really, really useful. Um, if you can do that, this stuff doesn't apply. Usually, this has to do with systems that are passing critical control information or financial data or something or another. And basically, it's, it's sort of busted. Um, it may be your one chance in the next two or three months to actually diagnose this problem because it doesn't manifest often. Um, so we've had a, a, a bug in, in one of our systems that um, was every three or four months, um, we would have cross CPU latch contention issues in the kernel when establishing new TCP connections in. And it would only happen every two or three months in the system. So we have a load balancer, and it's driving, it's doing you know 30,000 connections a second, and then it would crawl down to like 400 requests a second that it would accept, and the kernel, it's all kernel issues, right? But the, the app was the visible problem, like it was, we were running Apache traffic server, and all of a sudden it's, it's request per second just plummeted. So in those sorts of situations, the worst thing you can do is fix the problem, because by fixing the problem, you're just going to have it again in three months. And you're going to have another performance regression. You need to be able to isolate the system. You need to be able to treat it in a way where you can actually formally diagnose the problem and you can ensure that you fixed it. Otherwise, you just have that liability floating out there. So you need to understand liabilities and risks and have a good gauge of how long you think it's going to take to be able to fix the problem and how much time costs how much money. Right, so this will influence the different techniques that you use, whether or not you want to jump into a debugger, whether or not you're going to write dtrace scripts, whether or not you're going to core the file and like intentionally crash the process, which is a great technique in general. Um, so, so you need to be able to weigh these things. And the, the, the thing is, is that I see a lot of people um, that are too tenacious. They just won't let the problem alone, right? So they're, they're, they're debugging the problem at the expense of the entire organization. They're like leaving the service broken longer than they should, or they should be allowed to. So you kind of have to put those, um, it's the same techniques that if anybody does any operational remediation, if you've got a, like a database outage and you need to fail over to your secondary database or you need to restore from backup, there are times that those things take and there are times that you must make those decisions within. Right? So if the database crashes and I'm going to fail to the standby and I can't do that for some reason within 15 minutes, I have to start doing a offsite restore. Like, I'm an idiot if I don't do that. Even if I think I'm really close, right? That's just a horrible idea. So you need to have these mental time markers where I'm going to give myself five minutes to debug this because I know how much five minutes is going to cost. And then at the end of five minutes, you're either successful or not. Um, and the upside, and we'll get to that, is at the end of five minutes, you can be really, really nasty to the system because you've already, you're already screwed at that point. All right, so we have some rules. Uh, the first rule is that it's absolutely critical that you understand your tools. Um, if you're on Linux, you, you want to know things. So there's a new tool that came out pretty recently called Sysdig, which is neat. Um, certainly doesn't give you all the power that you need, but it kind of glues two tools together in a really happy way. 
Um, there's strace. Uh, you need TCP dump snoop sometimes on the network. Um, system tap is incredibly useful, though somewhat dangerous. Um, in these situations, again, it's a production system that's broken, so if it crashes, well, it's going to reboot and come back up. Everything's fine, right? So, like, breaking it isn't really the risk. It's prolonging the outage that it's a risk. So, the better, so system tap, which is a rather unsafe tool and can kernel panic your box with great gusto, um, is really not appropriate um, for doing online performance analysis and things like that. It's pretty dangerous. But if you're doing debugging, you already have a bug. You already have some sort of failure condition. The worst case scenario is that you're going to pop the box and, and then it's going to come back up. Um, so, and, and GDB. Um, and if you're on Lumos or FreeBSD or any of the others, you're going to have different variants of those tools. The critical reason why you need to understand your tools, and these tools do not make you awesome, but you will suck without them, is that you have five minutes to debug it, or you have 20 minutes to debug it, and if you spend that 20 minutes in a fucking man page, it's really not cool, right? That's not where you want to be. You want to be diagnosing the problem, um, which is, uh, this, this is why I go to work every day, because I love these sorts of problems. So the other thing is that you need to really understand the stack that you're working in. You need to understand the whole entire stack, like how do packets enter your network, like through which routers and switches, what kind of servers are you running? Are they Intel or AMD? It matters. Are they multi-core or multi-processor multi-core? That matters. Is NUMA in effect? What kernel are you running? Um, what languages and runtimes are you running? Because if you're trying to debug an app that's written in C or C++ or Java or Python, all the techniques and tools are different there. Um, and then you also, it's fundamental no matter what language you, you are using, if it's Java, you need to understand how libc works, basically. The only one that kind of violates that in an unsavory way is Go. Um, but then you still need to know how syscalls work. So you need, and the, guess what? All the syscalls and the kernel still written in C. So you need to be able to read those things and understand how they work. So cakes, everybody knows. Is cake a good analogy? I'm not sure. Really, we always think about sausage factories when we think about software because nobody really wants to know how the code is written. It's kind of nasty. You find all these things. Go look in the OpenSSL code. It's a great, great testament to how things can basically work and have a very low bug count, quite honestly, and just be horrific on the inside. So I like meat. That's a picture of me eating sausage, um, a very long strain of sausage. And that's a picture of the sausage factory. And that's a picture of my family understanding what it really means to eat sausage. And yes, they still eat meat because it tastes good. But while software engineering, I think, is very much a very, very metaphorically accurate sausage factory, um, I think that the layer cake is a better example. And uh, one of the main ingredients of the layer cake is molasses. And this is one of my favorite slides from postmortem analysis. This is the epic 1915 Boston molasses disaster. I had a huge silo of molasses, and it was a really hot day, and it exploded. And there were 10-foot waves of molasses going at 35 miles an hour through the city. Killed 15 people, injured 150 people. And for the next 40 years, on really hot summer days, the houses in the area would seep molasses from the, from the beams, the wood beams. Because it, it, I mean, it basically saturated everything um, and it absorbed into the wood. So when it got really hot, you'd see molasses drip. So this, I think, is much more akin to nasty bugs that happen. Because um, they, they, they plague you for a really long period of time. Um, uh, they, they tend to always be replayed in slow motion. Right? And you have an outage that's five minutes long and it's a disaster. Uh, when you dream about that, that's going to be four hours long and it's going to be very painful. So, um, so the second rule of debugging is that never ever debug in the critical path if it can be avoided. So this is a, there's a, a very common, especially in the cloud, a very common architectural design idea is to have everything in the architecture redundant. 
And when I mean redundant, I mean that it's not that you have two and need two, it's that you have four and you need one, or you have four and you need two. So the idea of having a database node like a Cassandra node, uh, say your Cassandra node malfunctions. Well, you know that if you lose a Cassandra node, the service still operates. So this is an incredibly powerful tool in debugging because it means that you can isolate that node without stopping it or restarting it to understand the state of the system while you're debugging it. And you have no risk to the external service. So now your five minutes maybe became three days where you get a, a, a Java engineer, a Cassandra engineer in there looking at your live running process, trying to figure out how the fuck it got into the state that it's in, where it's deleting all your data or overwriting it or whatever Cassandra's doing these days when it, when it has a bug. Um, so that is a critical design element. So anytime in your service where you can design a message queue, for example, there's a lot of message queues out there that are clustered. Uh, RabbitMQ is a great example. Um, we actually run two unclustered message queues in our system and send all data to both. And all of the apps can re read from either, right? So, or read from both and dedupe the messages. So we have these two and when one of them malfunctions or for, perhaps they both malfunction, I can take one offline and pop the other one. So now I have a fresh one and I'm running at half redundancy, but I've got an isolated, unrebooted, fucked up process there. And it's not in production traffic. Now I've taken it out of the flow so there's no negative business impact that extends my time frame for debugging it. It also gives me a lot more flexibility um, to, to, to choose my approach carefully because some of the approaches we'll talk about are a little dangerous. All right, so do that if you can. The third rule is that you should always make sure that you can get post-mortem dumps, always. So my rule is that the, if the system is broken because, the, the system is broken because someone's a chump, and if you can't get a core, you're the chump, right? So if your Linux box kernel panics, and you do not have a core afterwards, you shouldn't be running Linux. You can do that, by the way. You can absolutely get a core uh, after you've done Linux. Somehow, no one seems to want to do that, um, and what that means is that the same kernel panic plagues organizations for a year while they're trying to send these little stack traces to Red Hat or to Canonical or whatever. And, and a kernel engineer looking at a stack trace, sometimes they can intuit that. But you know what? An actual core of the entire system with all of the stacks, all of the states, all the process tables, that's, that's the holy grail. You have that. It's very rare that you get a full core file and you can't actually diagnose and solve a problem in the first go. Usually one core is all you need. So the idea that your box would panic or your app would panic and you don't have a core file, you should stop and you should fix that problem. Because most of the stuff that you do to analyze the, the, the state of the system can actually be done on a core as well as on a process. So when you arrive in, in, in debugging production, you already know debugging in production, everything is already lost. Like, the system doesn't actually work correctly. You're already providing a disservice to your users, right? So one of my favorite quotes is from a movie called Gross Point Blank. He said he's a pre he leaves high school and he becomes a professional killer. And he's trying to justify it to somebody. And he said, well, you know, think about it this way. If I show up at your door, chances are you did something to bring me there, right? Nobody would put a hit out on somebody unless they did something wrong. So if I'm gonna go kernel panic a box or destroy something or break your system, Chances are something brought me there in the first place, so don't blame me for it. Um, everything's already broken, uh, and you're in the danger zone. So call Kenny Loggins. Nobody gets this. So sad. Somebody gets this. Danger zone. So um, one other thing that is really important, and this is what I see in a lot of, um, uh, I say, novice uh, debuggers, is that they try to use their intuition way too much. Um, there perhaps is a time for faith. It is not when your production system is broken. Um, your, your app is supposed to work, right? All the code is supposed to work. It runs on a kernel that's not supposed to have bugs. None of that is actually true. Every piece of faith that you place in your system behaving the way it's supposed to is clearly misplaced. So every single thing, every single assumption that you make about the system should be verified. So if you assume First step, when you're running, like a, say you're running Postgres on a box and it's malfunctioned and it's not returning the, the correct result set. Um, first step, the Postgres process, 
that's in memory, is it actually coming from the binary you think it is? Are you even running the Postgres you think you're running? And there are ways to validate that more than just saying, oh, the path is right, right? You can actually look at the AS segment in proc and match it to the one on disk and say, you know what, maybe somebody upgraded Postgres and never restarted it. So I'm actually debugging a problem that I could never even potentially repeat, right? So every single step needs to be confirmed. Um, and if you think you've seen a problem like this before and you want to jump ahead, and this is what I think really advanced debuggers, uh, production debuggers do, is that they'll look at the system and verify some things and then they'll start to pattern match in their head and they say, I think it's this. And they jump 50 steps ahead in the debugging process, which is super dangerous. And it's why they're really good at it, is because they're often right. And the other thing is, is that they're willing to rewind all the way back to the beginning when they're wrong. So don't jump 50 steps ahead and then be like, oh, that doesn't look right, and then back up two steps, and then back up three steps, and then go forward. You've jumped ahead in the entire process. You really need to go from the beginning. And if you do that a lot, you get really fast at it. So. Um, in most environments, the most interesting part of your system is where the application hits the kernel. Um, that is through syscalls in general. If your operating system has a way for apps to talk into the kernel in a more unsavory way from that, I feel for you. Um, we work on some of those systems. Uh, so your app can't actually do anything except for math without talking to the kernel, right? It can't send any data, it can't accept any sockets, it can't write to any files can't do anything without talking to the kernel. So um, I want to be on a different box than this. Hold on. So if I look at an app here, um, this is on an, on an OmniOS box which is a lot like Solaris. Um, if I truss, which is strace on Linux, I'm going to, it's gonna tell me I'm not root. So first production troubleshooting, screw the rules, come root. Um, so this is an app. We don't even know what it's really doing. And I'm, I picked this app because nobody here runs it, basically. Um, and this, looks the same as any Java process that you'd see or web server that you'd see. It's all of the syscalls that are happening in this app. You can guess what pwrite is. It's writing data to a socket, 28. Functal, this is setting locks on a file. Um, we've got uh, fstat, it's checking, checking read, write, modified time size on a file, metadata on a file. Uh, hey, the time call, everybody can figure out what that is. Now we know what time it is. Um, so there are all of these syscalls that are happening. Um, and it gives me an idea of where um, the, the application is, what the application is doing, how it's interacting with the system, how it's interacting with other systems on the same network uh, by writing the sockets. Um, uh, on this, we have an app called pfiles. Um, on almost every other OS, that's called lsof, um, which will give you a list of open files. So what I can do, so I can look at this list of open files, and I can see all of these sockets that are open, and I can see these files, and I'm looking at this guy. So hey, let's say I wanna see anything that's written to file descriptor 30. I can do something, I'll cheat, and just grep for anything that has 30 in it, like that. There we go, look at that. Now I can see, so I'm picking up some stuff that's not appropriate, but um, but I'm seeing F stats and P reads from this file. So I know that the application is statting and reading this file. I also happen to know that every time it's reading, it's also reading eight bytes. It's always reading eight bytes, which is interesting. Okay. So uh, by understanding this, uh, if you're specifically if you're running something like a Java process or a web server, it's very useful to run this when the system is working. <laughs> because if you don't know what the app's doing, it's very hard to kind of map that back and try to figure out everything that the, map, the, that the app is doing. Um, but if you know what, the, what this sort of output looks like when the application is performing, 
its function correctly. Then you can run it again when it's not performing its function correctly, and you can start to see the differences. You can start to say, hey, there's an accept call here that blocks, and it didn't block in the other one. Um, or, hey, I'm reading and writing from this file descriptor a lot, and I never saw that before when, when the app works right. So that's, that's kind of an interesting boundary. So the other thing is that being able to see on both sides of that boundary is really important. And I think one of the problems with GDB in general, if you already know that the bug is in your app, great, you can use GDB to do that. But when it's malfunctioning, you don't want to limit your debugging to a specific portion of that stack. You really want to see through the whole thing. Um, so there are certain tools that can span more than just a single stack. Uh, Dtrace, in my opinion, is the best one of those. SystemTap does a, a decent job of it. But Dtrace allows you to ask questions about the kernel, about the hardware, about the processors, about the disk I.O. system, about your apps, um, all sorts of things, all at the same time. So, oops, different car accident. It's great. Um, so, um, let's trust this again. And I'm going to grab for E again. So I have this thing here that keeps calling E again on receive from, right? Which means that I'm not getting a whole payload coming back when I'm trying to receive. When I'm trying to receive on a socket, it's not blocking. I ask for 100 bytes. I, I, don't get, I don't get it. It doesn't have 100 bytes. So it doesn't give me that. It doesn't, you know, maybe it gives me four or five. It would probably say four or five there. So here, there's just no data available on that socket. Where in the code is that happening? That is the type of question that's really important to be able to ask in production. I have this thing, I have this symptom, I know it sort of looks like this. Who the hell's doing it? So in Dtrace, you can do things like this. So um, I'll probably just write a D script to do this. Nah, command line. Okay, so these are system calls. And particularly, they are receive system calls. Um, so I can track system calls called receive. And I can track their return. And I'm only, to, only going to look at processes that look like Noit. And hopefully, I'm going to get something. Maybe that receive is not actually the system call name here, and that it's received from. There it is. Yep. So now I see my receive from calls. This is not the app. This is the kernel returning from receive from, which is interesting. And what I can do is I can say, I, I want to know when the return value is negative 1, because that's an error. Oh, OK a little bit less. I want to know when erno is e again. This is where it helps know your stuff. Anybody know what erno e again is? Bingo. 11. So I have those, which is interesting. And now I want to print out a stack trace from my app when that happens. So I have all of the stack traces. And these are coming from a ping check, most of them. So I wanted to do that instead of against receive from, I wanted to do that against read. And figure out what reads in my code base are actually returning E again. Now I've got some sort of Lua function calling a POSIX read layer that's calling read, and it's returning E again. Another super useful thing is I can say something like, hold on a second, ptrace-l-p, damn it. Oh, I'm in a zone. I can't do that in a zone. Um, so the other things that you can ask are, uh, when do I get descheduled on and off the CPU? What 
stack trace caused me to be descheduled off the CPU. Um, those are really useful for finding out where you're blocking in your app. So now back to something else. Um, the problem with, so everything that we've talked about so far, it doesn't stop your process from running. So the problem with using something like GDB, I don't know if anybody knows how GDB works, but it's actually rather insane how it works. The same way p-files and LSOF work, it actually adds a thread into your process called an auxiliary helper thread. And then it pauses all the other threads and then allows you to poke around at them. And then when you detach, it deregisters that thread from that process. So you're actually inside of your process running code as your process that's broken, which is really strange, right? So writing a debugger is actually a pain in the ass. The important part, though, is that it attaches and manipulates your process state. So it's changing how your process is working and it's stopping your process. So if you attach to a debugger, the process will stop, which means that if you have any sort of watchdog timeouts or anything like that, it's going to kill the process off while you're looking at it. So sometimes you need to be able to run a debugger and kind of be quick about it. So one of the techniques there is really just to script out what you want to do in GDB or MDB or DBX and attach and pipe it in as a, as a script. So you attach, run your script, and, and, and detach. And then you analyze the output and realize how you didn't do your script right, and then you do it again, and you do it again, and you do it again. Um, so there are ways, let's see if I can, can show that. So for example, on the same box, let's say I wanted to get a stack trace for every thread in that system. Um, actually, let me break it first. That'll be great. Um, let me mdb p uh, pgrep dash n D. I just attached to it. Um, let me get a stack trace. Oops, stack. All right, I see my stack there. I'm going to wait a couple seconds. See my stack again. Uh oh, what the hell happened? Right? Well, this system is a production system, and if the process pauses, the system will, will destroy it and try it again. Like, it's not acceptable for this process to not be running well. This happens with a lot of Erlang processes. This happens with a lot of high performance C. Is there's a monitor process on this that's, that has a heartbeat. And when the heartbeat dies, it's going to kill the process off. So right now, I, I, can't, I can't, it doesn't have any threads in it. The, the, the process is gone, it's been killed. So um, what I can do instead is echo my commands and try to be faster about it. So I'll do a, a walk across all threads, and I will find stack on each of those. Pipe. Boom. Now, fast enough. I'm in and out. Detached. Now I have stack trace for all of the various threads in that process. Um, I can print out global variables in there. So I can do things like, um, let me say, I happen to know what some of the variables are in this are, but I could do a, um, what is it, polls by name is one of the global variables. Stores things. And I can do a print on that, and boom, I can have that come out. And I've attached, and if you, you do this, a little like this, time, it took less than, less than 100, uh, less than 100 milliseconds. Um, so that is one great technique to do that. Sometimes what you want to do is not conducive to this, and a great way to work around that problem is I have this process called noit that is at this process ID, and I'm going to gcore that. One, boom. Now I have a core dump. The process is still running, it's still there. Everything's good, but I have this core dump. It's a tiny one, but all right, so now I can go onto that and I can do things like what was the stack while it while I cored it. So you can actually do a post-mortem analysis on a core file. You can take it on another box. You can give it to another engineer. Um, obviously, if, if, you're, if you have like SSL certs in there, you probably want to be really careful if you take it off the box, and stuff like that. Um, but you can move this around, and the, and the process is not going to get killed while you're doing analysis. And basically, troubleshooting and debugging is all about asking a question, thinking about the answer you got, and figuring out what question is next. Um, and sometimes that takes a lot, some time between them. Um, and if you can kind of unobtrusively um, uh, do this, 
the big value of core files is a lot of times when you're looking at a specific state and you have a question, you get an answer, you think about it for a couple minutes, and then you have another question about that state. And if you're not actually working on a, a fixed core file, the process has moved on in life. So if you do another interactive debugging session, um, the state has changed already. So you're not looking at a fixed snapshot in time. Uh, all right. So now we'll go on to something much more crazy. Uh, another technique. You can do this with system tap as well. I just don't know how, so you have to do a little bit of research. Um, so here's a simple C program. It's one page long. Uh, all it does is it sees a, a random number generator, it gets a random number, and if R and and 11, increment Q4, else increment Q3. Sleep 10 milliseconds in a while loop. So as you'd imagine, if I run this, it just sits there because it doesn't do anything. It doesn't print anything out. Um, anybody see any bugs in this code? Some great ones. GCC doesn't warn you unless you do wwall. No, 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 it shouldn't be a president's issue. But these two are pretty bad. They're global variables that aren't static, so they're not initialized to zero, um, which is problematic, uh, not necessarily. They are in C99, but behind that, they're not. Um, so here's the question, is what is this process doing? So if I do a pgrep on branch, I get the process ID, that's great. Okay, so now I can do a trust-p. Anybody want to guess what it's going to be doing? Nano sleeping. It's just going to be sleeping. That's all it's doing. 10 milliseconds at a pop. It does not tell me anything about how this thing is behaving. So here's the question. This is a production app that let's say it's doing something wrong. And it's running right now. And if I restart it, some sort of some sort of, some sort of uh, thing will change state. So let's say this is some deeply nested function that's doing some evaluation, and you, you, you're like looking at it, and you're like, the only way that could be possible is if we're going into this case and we shouldn't be going into this case. So naturally, the software engineer would write a printf between the else and the Q3, restart the process, and then your bug goes away, and you wait like, 12 months later, that engineer doesn't work there anymore, and somebody gets this printout, and they're like, what is the printout for? So that doesn't work very well. So what we really want to do is figure out which of these predicate outputs am I in. Okay, so now this is where we have to look at this compiled. So I'm going to disassemble uh, that out of this program. So now I know what main looks like. So, actually not too complicated. Um, the magic part here is that we're jumping at the end. This is clever. It was a while ago. We're jumping here to OX2A, which is right here, which is a call. Okay, the only function call that we had in there other than usleep um, was, uh, was the uh, DRAND, right? So this must be DRAND. Um, and then we're doing some stuff, probably ooh, we're anding some stuff together, moving it. Then we're testing to see something, and we're jumping. And this one jumps to 14. No, no, sorry, it jumps to, jumps to main plus 53. All right. So now this is an if. This is one of the answers, and this is the other answer. Then I call you sleep, and then I repeat. Okay, so we've kind of diagnosed it. Luckily, on this box, I have debugging symbols in here, so I actually know which variables it was operating on, um, which is really interesting because almost every compiler will invert those, given the way it was written. The important part here is that here is where I increment Q4, and here is where I increment Q3. So if I detrace PID target main, first off, I'm going to give you a little hint of dtrace-l will list all possible probes 
for that, for that process. Ah, violated rule zero. Pid target. Boom. So here we go. This is what this looks like. I have main entry, and then I actually have every single offset of every single instruction that I can probe. So, if I disassemble again, oh shit, oh no, this F main branch, <laughs> right? So now I, I can, I need to, I, I need 46 and I need 5A. So I'm gonna disassemble 46 and 5A. And now it's actually probing every time any of those two instructions are hit. So now we have a supposition. Let's, let's say our random number generator was broken which I can't simulate because I'm not in the global zone here. Um, but uh, in that program, I want to verify that, anybody know the distribution there? I'm getting a completely random number and I'm checking to make sure the last two bits are one. So there are four total options there. I'm testing for one of them. So this one should increment a quarter of the time and this one should increment three quarters of the time. So what I can do, is I can say something like, uh, you know, show me an aggregate of the probe name and just count them up. I'm gonna let that run. I'm gonna let it run for a while. So this process is still running. Nobody's fucked with it at all. It's still servicing everybody that's servicing. And then I pop it out and it says, I hit 4A 199 times and I hit 4 6 641 times. So it allows you to verify that your application is actually working the way you had intended to um, without adding any debugging code. Um, and above and beyond that, uh, if you look at other applications like Apache, HTTPD, I'm not sure it was ever put back into mainline. It was put back into APR though. So anybody here run HTTPD? Yes, okay, some people. Um, the modules, when, they, when you load a module at HTTPD, uh, it, it hooks into the system and it uses APR hooks to hook in. Well, APR hooks support dtrace probes. So if you compile your modules, you kind of magically get entry and exit probes for every single hook point. You don't need to know the C code. Um, so in your apps, this was a kind of a gratuitous example of how you can see every single opcode in a function, which is a little intimidating. You don't want to be having to run disassembly on everything when you debug it. If you are writing an app and you actually annotate things with dtrace probes, when you build them and run them, those prob probes become visible as human readable first class citizens in the, in the, in, in the system. Um, and I, can, I won't dig into it, Oops. And, but I'll show you sort of what they look like. Uh, dtrace dash L dash P, because we put them in our stuff. Wait, star. So I have all these probes for this system. So anybody use logging in their stuff and they can't afford to turn logging on in production because it's too expensive? So now I have this log command and none of the logs are actually being printed out, but when I run this, I get every single log that fires in any, anything in the system, no matter what the bug level it's on, because there's a dtrace probe in that. So it'll enable, the, it'll enable the probe effect, then it'll enable the probe, and now I can start actually looking at my app, looking at the debugging outputs, and enabling specific lines of debugging from the console. They never go to debugging logs, they only come to me, and debug my application that way. So it's pretty frickin' powerful. Let's see if I can illustrate that a little bit better. Percent S, copy and stir arg. Three. It's all my log lines everywhere in the whole system. 
So the interesting part is that if I do arg1, I think it's the file name. So let's say I only wanted to print out debugging lines from a specific file. I can come back here and do something like copy and stir arg1 equals dns.c printf arg3. Now I'm only getting debug lines from my dns.c file. Also turns out that in, in our implementation, the way our logging probes work is that we pass in the file name and the line number and the string. So I can actually isolate it to specific line numbers. I can say print out, turn on all debugging all the way down to the gratuitous level between this line and that line on this file. And because dtrace is programmatic, I can actually turn those on only under certain circumstances. So for example, I can do some other check and say, when I write to disk and I get an error, start printing that out. And then when this other thing happens, turn it off again. So basically you can instrument with a, with a awk-like programming language the entire debugging of your app and the kernel at the same time. So dtrace is like crack cocaine. And you don't have it on Linux unless you're running Oracle Enterprise Linux. Um, some of this stuff you can do with S-Trace, uh, with System Tap, but it's, it's fairly painful and slightly dangerous because you can panic your kernel by accident. Um, D-Trace is designed to be safer than that. Um, so if you're, especially if you're running a Java app, um, it's definitely, because that whole U-Stack thing that I did there, where I printed out the U-Stack, you can print out a J-Stack, you get Java Stack Trace, <laughs> right? So, and there are Py there's Python helper for it, there's a Ruby helper for it, there's a Node.js helper for it. It's pretty powerful. Um, it's worth trying an operating system that supports dtrace, um, and that would include everything but Linux. So uh, QNX, Mac OS X, FreeBSD, Solaris, Illumos, all of them support uh, dtrace. And I already went over this, but if you can't do post-boredom analysis, um, on, on, if you can't do interactive debugging on the system, then you use G-Core to, to drop it. Um, and that's kind of it. So you should try OmniOS, because it's the one I work on. But um, anybody have any questions about stuff? That is ptrace. So is that just to enter the password you can check for? So maybe yeah. insert check on relay, right? This is just to do ptrace. Yes, so ptrace provides all of those mechanisms. The ptrace interface is the way that the kernel enables you to do all of that. It's ptrace and libproc, I think, are, uh, is how that works. Mac OS X does it differently, which is if anybody ever runs a debugger on Mac OS X and it asks you for your root password, yeah, it's foul and evil, but yeah, so typically the, the kernel provides a facility to instrument the processes like that, but it's still in user space completely. Um, so it's an extra auxiliary helper thread that's doing that. So same way on Illumos as it is on Linux and FreeBSD. Yeah, I think the future with LLDB is much brighter because it, it can actually compile your tracing programs because it's LLVM based and everything. Um, but uh, I mean, GDB is not not that bad. It doesn't. If you're on Linux, GDB is not that bad. Um, it works pretty well. Uh, I think the problem is is that when you do things non-interactively, and it goes off the rails. I mean, it completely goes off the rails, right? You have to really script the whole program and do GDB macros to do your while loops and your for loops and all of that kind of stuff. So if you're debugging an app and you're using GDB commonly, what you really want is a GDB init file for that app that has mechanisms, macros, to print out like all your different types of data structures and walk them the way you would want to walk them. So like if you have a hash table, it would know to iterate through the hash table and only find buckets that have data in them and print them out. Um, 
Uh, similarly, if you're using MDB, you, you get to write those, but you write them in C and you can send them with your app. So like you can build iterators for all your different data structures in the debugger, um, which also works on core files. So you can actually go through all of those things work on core files as well. So the more you, once you become like a master GDB debugger, um, all of it really applies to the interactive stuff as well. It's just kind of crufty. That's it. Okay, thank you very much.